So hi there, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's software webinar hosted by the GE Global Research Team. My name is Isabella Teixeira, and I'm a member of the GE Global Research Communications and Public Affairs Team. And on behalf of everyone here with me, I'd like to welcome you to today's event. We are coming to you live from NIFTI in New York, which is Global Research's headquarters. In the room with me, I have three of our researchers who are all going to introduce themselves, but they're here to talk to us today about some of the exciting work that we're doing in the software space and specifically in electric vehicles. So before I hand it over to them, let me just talk through some logistics for today's event. So first and foremost, you should be hearing me through your computers for those who are tuned in via your laptop. If you experience any issues, uh, please be sure to dial into our teleconference, which you should be seeing the number in front of you. And for those of you who are joining us by teleconference, please be sure to keep your phone lines muted uh, until we're ready for question and answer. We will go through a brief presentation with you, and we will be happy to take your questions uh, at the end of our event. But at any time, please feel free to use the message feature on the WebEx to submit any questions throughout the event. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our software team. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Jerry Klein, and I'd like to talk to you today about uh, some of our research on electric vehicle agent-based simulation. I'll be uh, ho co-hosting the webinar with my coworkers, Jim Quayle and Shan Chang Wayne. Now, uh, let me just give you a little introduction to myself. I've been with GE three and a half years, and uh, prior to GE, I got an, a PhD in applied physics and an MBA, and worked in a variety of technology and finance positions. And since my time at GE here at Global Research, I've developed expertise in uh, financial risk management and uh, agent-based simulation and simulating assets operating in their environment. Uh, the three of us are centered in, the, in GE Global Research software sciences and analytics technology domain, and within that, there's a small group called Quantitative Finance, where I reside, and my two colleagues work in the Management Science Lab here at Global Research, and the Management Science Lab really specializes in simulation, optimization, and operations research. And uh, back in 2008, our Management Science Lab was recognized with the INFORMS Prize for Excellence in Operations Research. So before I get into the heart of the webinar today, I just wanted to say a couple words about global research here at GE. So on the screen, you can see a picture of our site here in this unit in New York. It was the first U.S. industrial research lab, and it began in 1900 and is connected to New York. The founding principle of the lab is to improve business through technology. And there's a nice mix here at the research center. There's a little under 2,000 technologists here. And there's, uh, the research here sort of runs the gamut from very pure fundamental research to very applied research where our technologists work very closely with the GE businesses. And as you can envision, GE is a very large, diverse company with, you know, leading technology in jet engines, medical imaging, transportation, energy turbines, and many other things. So the, the diversity of the research here at the GE Global Research is very wide. And there's a lot of different domains and disciplines, and, you know, it's a pretty fun place to work if you get excited by a lot of technology in different areas. G's Global Research is, uh, we have research centers throughout the globe. There's, the biggest site is in this unit in New York, but we also have research centers in India, China, Germany, and our newest uh, research center is in Brazil. So now I'd like to give a little agenda for our webinar today. I'm going to talk to you a little about the EV landscape and give an introduction on agent-based simulation. And then I'll turn the presentation over to Jim Quayle, 
is going to talk about our granular EV adoption model, and then Shan Chen Wang will talk about our charging infrastructure simulation. So uh, here's uh, GE and the EV landscape. GE is very proactive in understanding and championing EVs. About a year ago, GE made some very public announcements with our commitment to electric vehicles and this area. And I encourage you to go to the web and read those uh, press releases from about a year ago. So EVs really touch GE in many different ways. The uh, GE manufactures and sells the watt station chargers. That's part of our industrial solutions business. GE also has a large fleet of vehicles for personal use, and GE Capital is also the one of the largest lessors of uh, fleets of vehicles around the world. <clears throat> so as these vehicles and fleets become electrified, GE really has to understand the implications of that and how to manage those fleets of vehicles. Also, as you'd expect, GE is uh, very active in the grid infrastructure, and it's very interesting in understanding how electric vehicles will influence the, uh, the electrical distribution network and what kind of technology and products we need to help support EVs in that domain. GE also owns a lot of commercial real estate and leases a lot of commercial real estate buildings and is interested in uh, how to place chargers in, in those types of buildings. So, uh, you know, electric vehicles is really an emerging landscape. Uh, electric vehicles really became widely commercial available only in this year. And... Uh, so it's really a new technology with many unanswered questions. So uh, we're trying to do some of our research here at Global Research to help understand some of these questions, such as what does the EV adoption curve look like? What will be the impact on the electricity distribution network? How will the charging infrastructure evolve? And what new business models will emerge? So our goal is really to, in our lab, is to apply advanced simulation models, expert reasoning, and operations research to help understand these questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, here I'd like to kind of give a little background on the major simulation paradigms that that are traditional in the field and that we use here at GE. So in the top, we have a, a system dynamics perspective. This technology kind of roughly came on the scene in the 1950s, and it typically describes systems and simulates them in time from more or less a top-down approach, where you might have differential equations relating the stocks and flows in the system. And the stocks that are envisioned there are typically homogeneous type trons, so it really doesn't have the ability to differentiate. They're just sort of homogeneous buckets of stocks. And then in the middle, <coughs> we have a discrete event simulation, which is a a little bit newer technology than system dynamics. And discrete event is very useful for simulating passive objects uh, going through systems such as factories or queues and lines. And uh, it can be a very efficient simulation technology because you, as you step through time, you can only simulate where there actually are events happening, and, and hence the name discrete event. Now, uh, agent-based is a bit of a newer technology, kind of came into being around the 1990s. And the difference with agent-based technology is it tries to really understand and model the system from the granular bottom down parameters or characteristics, their own states and rules and behaviors. So if you model the behavior of all the individual granular agents, that will aggregate up to the behavior of the entire system. So it's really more of a bottoms-up way to understand it. And uh, agent-based, the agent-based approach can be a good approach if you have uh, problems that contain active objects, such as people, products, business units, vehicles. And if they have timing, event ordering, or individual behaviors and rules they follow. So agent-based approach has been very successful in modeling marketplaces, competition, populations, and other large-scale systems with lots of different actors and behaviors. It's also very useful if the problem contains heterogeneous objects. 
interesting characteristics or behaviors. And then it derives the global dynamics of the system from the bottom up where you model the individual behaviors. So it can be a, a very clean way to model things because each agent can kind of operate on its own simpler rules and behaviors. On the bottom of this chart, we show a state chart, which is typically the way you represent an agent. And then this is an example of using agent-based simulation to simulate commercial aircraft fleets. So you can see the agent can be in different states, such as active, parked, disassembled, or destroyed. And there's rules and transitions between those states. So we've uh, used agent-based approach at GE for a number of years. Some of the uh, bigger projects we've had was that we're involved in right now is the Hudson River dredging. So GE is committed to uh, simulation to simulate the logistics of that large cleanup. And uh, it's been very useful to help improve the efficiency of the procedure and the environmental performance of the procedure. We also have a simulation product called Hospital of the Future, which we use to help understand patient flow in hospitals and to design efficient hospital systems. So uh, why is the agent-based approach a good fit for EV simulation? Well, if you think about the EV landscape, it's going to be made up of uh, these individual agents that can make their own choices, such as consumers. They can decide whether to buy an electric vehicle car. And as they're operating their electric vehicles, they all may have their own different missions and routes, and they might have rules of when they need to recharge. So it fits very well for the agent-based structure. And if you think about it, the potential EV adopters are very heterogeneous mixed. They may have very different uh, properties in terms of their incomes, their commute distance, their image about green vehicles, government incentives, energy costs, and climate. So here's a nice example of how adaptive an agent-based model can be. So in the first part, we have a car that does its daily mission. It just drives from home to work and back to home. And it's fairly predictable, so it can charge at home and it can charge at the workplace every day. Well, the model has the same flexibility. If that car is decided to take a uh, extended journey, it, it realizes it has to find a public charger and you can imbue the agent with the intelligence to decide when it needs to charge and where it needs to charge. So here's a blow-up of uh, our state chart, our agent of the EV driver. And as you'll see in our model, we have many different – it's called AnyLogic, which is developed by a company called XJ Technologies. And it's a fully Java-based platform, so we can uh, write – various Java code to control these rules and transitions. And you can see on the screen we have embedded functions in the agents and embedded variables. So they can go and operate and measure their customer satisfaction and various parameters about them. And you can graphically see all the agents in their own states. And you'll get a feel for that in our live demo coming up soon. So I just want to throw this slide in to kind of really explain the goals of this research you're going to see and to add a disclaimer. So the goals of our research here at the Research Center is to evaluate these advanced software modeling techniques and apply them to understanding emerging business areas. So we really want to identify and invent potential techniques and approaches. And what we're trying to do is create demonstration prototypes to articulate these approaches and understand how they're going to work and what requirements they have. And then decide from these demonstration prototypes, we would rate the usefulness of these concepts and you know, decide whether to go forward and invest more to really make these into more rigorous models with the proper calibrations and, and whatnot. The, uh, so these models, you'll see, will they integrate dynamic simulations, reasoning concepts, GIS, and data sources. And the two applications we have here is the adoption of EVs by geographical location and the impact of charging infrastructure on both the satisfaction of EV drivers and and the utilization of the charging infrastructure. And I just want to include these two disclaimers here. So first one is the results that were shown today are for proof of concept purposes only. These models are not well calibrated or validated, and the results 
of these models are for illustrative purposes only and are not actual numbers that are meant to represent GE estimates. And the second thing is the work that we're showing here is the product of GE Global Research. The concepts and results here are not meant to represent the views of the larger GE company. So before I uh, turn the presentation over to Jim Quayle, I'm just having a little trouble switching slides, of course. Thank you. So before I turn it over to Jim, I just want to give a highlight of what you're going to see on today's webinar. So Jim is going to show a granular EV adoption model, which has the ability to use granular data by zip code to predict EV adoption. And then Shan Chan is going to show a live demo of our charging infrastructure simulation, which is an agent-based simulation that simulates the EV drivers undergoing their missions and charging patterns. And the simulation attempts to measure the satisfaction of the EV driving experience and examine the placement and utilization of charging infrastructure. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jim Quayle, and I'll join back on the end to help answer some questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Jim Quayle of the Management Sciences Laboratory, as you heard before. I happen to hold a uh, PhD in mechanical engineering from Lehigh University and an MBA in management science from the New York State University at Albany. I've been at the research center for over 30 years, involved in various areas of research dictated by my interest, my skill set, and the needs of the company. My recent research has been aimed at business-oriented modeling to aid business decisioning in the areas of risk, underwriting, pricing, logistics, throughput systems, and asset utilization, to name a few. Most recently, I've been utilizing advanced software techniques to simulate assets through time with an emphasis on agent-based techniques. I also incorporate reasoning where appropriate, as it is in this case. So why do we need reasoning uh, in our models in this case? Uh, well, all automakers uh, tend to attempt to determine what factors that customers would use to select cars for purchase. These factors are not purely logical and can be driven, that are driven by financial metrics such as first cost, mileage, etc. Uh, concept of brand loyalty is an ob obvious uh, nonlinear effect, non-logical factor where buyers these factors to make choices is even more important than just enumerating the factors. We think this is even more important in the electric vehicle space since there's not much in the way of historical data with which to derive behavioral models. In this exploratory research, we attempt to understand how to model the many factors that may influence people to purchase an electric vehicle. More specifically, we are attempting to understand suitable software modeling techniques and environments that will facilitate model development. The challenge is to model the multiple factors that drive the adoption in an easy to understand and explain manner. Currently, we're using uh, analogic version 6.6, as mentioned, from XJ Technologies. I'll now discuss our exploratory use of the reasoning technology to simulate the thought process of potential customers to quantify those factors for their preference of purchasing an EV versus a conventional or internal combustion car. We have previously addressed the challenge of capturing human reasoning over multiple heterogeneous factors in several domains such as risk, underwriting, pricing, to name a few. To facilitate the process, we have developed a proprietary approach called example-based evidential reasoning. To rely on expert knowledge in lieu of data, we need to elicit or extract the expert's thought process in a form that can be used in software models. This has been a perennial problem 
since the historical process of extraction has been very time consuming and the best experts typically explaining their thought process. GE developed a novel approach to make this process as simple and as painless as possible. We named it example-based evidential reasoning after the details of this technique. It addresses several challenges as shown on the screen. How to structure and store and process the knowledge. How to extract the knowledge, which is the very important part of it. How to overcome the lack of historic cases. How to blend model outputs with expert knowledge so we can take inputs from very complex models and blend them with expert knowledge. How to gracefully deal with missing information, uh, which is typically true in the uh, in various areas such as risk, and in this case where we're extracting information from electronic sources. So this approach can be found in the medical diagnostics field. Uh, more details to follow. Fundamentally, this approach originally attempted to simulate the thought process of physicians that attempt to reason over several pieces of evidence to arrive at a diagnosis. This process uses a mathematical technique to accumulate evidence to evaluate a hypothesis. The original work established the mathematical details of this approach but did not uh, access, address the difficulty of uh, formulating a model structure and of extracting knowledge from the experts to calibrate these models. This is what was addressed by the patent shown. Please review this patent for greater detail and an example of an application of this uh, technology. A hypothesis. For example, a hypothesis that the payment risk is low. As the sum's evidence approaches plus one, the belief in that hypothesis increases. As it becomes negative, the belief declines. The evidence combination approach is highly nonlinear. That is, its relative weights for each piece of evidence are not fixed, but depend on the values of other pieces of evidence of being combined. Evidence is summed by adding one piece at a time. The contribution of each successive piece of evidence depends on the sum of the preceding pieces. For instance, successive positive values will have less and less impact on the sum as it asymptotically approaches one. However, one piece of negative evidence will have a dramatic effect, and this is felt to model the way humans accumulate evidence, or at least in the case that was studied in the uh, medical arena. The modeling challenge is to assign the appropriate certainty factor, that is between minus one and plus one, to each piece of evidence. This is one of the, challenge that e uh, the challenges that Eber attacks. As mentioned, uh, the, this particular approach has been used in many GE applications over the years. Originally, we focused on risk-related projects and migrated to other areas that could benefit from this, this approach. Some examples here are shown, a uh, big one being uh, large financial deals for GE Capital have been using this technique uh, since about 1994. Uh, we've done a lot of work in insurance underwriting, um, credit line generation for receivables risk management, several competitive pricing activities and uh, some unusual types of things as acid reuse of news stories for NBC, which have a, a lot of details that need to be evaluated by experts. <clears throat> to evaluate how this approach could be applied to EV adoption, we created an EBER model where a preference where preference factors were selected by the research team and used to create a demonstration model which outputs the relative preference of a consumer slash potential adopter to buy an EV versus a conventional ICE vehicle. In this approach, each potential adopter has their own EBER model as part of an agent in an agent-based approach. This produces a reasonably complex agent 
each of which draw information that characterize it from various data sources. For instance, this model uses household income, commute distance, number of household vehicles, climate, etc., organized in a structure shown above in the slides. <clears throat> These factors may change over the simulation period in the model, and inputs can and do in this case include outputs from other models. In this case, we input results of financial models that commute, compute financial payback and operational costs. The values used by these models are extracted from various available electronic databases, such as the U.S. Census, GIS databases, etc. As mentioned, the initial model was created to demonstrate software modeling capabilities. It's commercialized domain experts will be used to, to create and calibrate the model. The uh, EPR model shown to the right organizes the preference factors to be considered into a tree structure, one tree for each potential adopter. The colors, in this case, indicate how well each element approaches its hypothesis. That is, green is good, that is, it's fulfilling its hypothesis. Red means it is, the hypothesis has been disproved, and yellow is sort of in the middle somewhere. <clears throat> each potential adopter is modeled by modified BAS diffusion model, included as part of its agent definition, which tracks its position in a state chart from a potential adopter to a vehicle adopter, either EV or internal combustion engine. The model utilizes this preference uh, from the EBER model, the vehicle availability, and word of mouth to affect its temporal state transitions. Adoption is determined by counting the EV and ICE users over time to give us a picture of the total population. To examine adoption in a given geographic area, the model summarizes all the agents within that area as a function of time. And it, and it uh, extracts that information, in this particular case, zip code by zip code. The results can be displayed in a map as shown, which uh, shows the adoption in New York State by zip code. Now, please remember that this is an uncalibrated model, not only used to explore the modeling approaches. Now, this concludes the section of the talk, of the talk and uh, we'll now move to the charging infrastructure placement and utilization by Shen Shen Wang. Hi, this is Shen Shen Wang from G Global Research. I've been working in the management science lab, and my expertise is around system modeling and simulation. So next, I'm going to present an agent-based simulation for charging infrastructure placement and utilization study. Charging infrastructure works for both plug-in hybrid electrical vehicle and pure electrical vehicles. But please note that in this presentation, we will focus on pure EV, short as EV. So we probably all realize that EVs are more dependent on charging infrastructure than traditional vehicles on gas stations. In general, EV is relatively limited in the range, driving range and take a longer time at each charge. So a network of charging infrastructure is critical to support EV driving needs so as to enable the EV adoption. The question is, how are we going to build this network? So when you really think about this, it actually can be broken down into a few sub-questions, such as how will a driver use the EV, what are their charging patterns, and what type of infrastructure will be available, and how can we put them, and et cetera. And these questions are difficult, not only because there are a lot of uncertainties in the future, but also because the players in the game are interactive. For example, how many public chargers will be needed depends on the number of people will be using them, and how many people will use them is related to the charger availability. So to model such a complex system, 
Agent-based simulation is a good technology to look at. It takes a button-up approach to capture the agent behaviors and their interaction. It is easy to add realistic constraints into the model, such as the operating hours of the chargers, and it lets different agents, like drivers, charge owner, to have the intelligence to make decisions and adapt with the environment which could be similar to how things work in real world. As we will see in the demonstration later, the, simulate, the simulation can give us a chance to observe the system level welfare governed by individuals' rules and visualize a pretty complicated scenario. So based on that, we can improve and optimize the system. So next, I'm going to give a demonstration um, about a model and in this work, we've been using multiple sources of information to generate synthetic agents to represent real-world objects like drivers. Um, and we've been evaluating certain techniques like agent-based modeling and GIS map. Uh, but even the model has a lot of details, but please note that it's still a prototype to prove the concept. And you see here the platform we are using is Analogic 6.6 .6 from XJ Technology. It's a powerful platform to if you want to use multiple simulation techniques in one model. And uh, for this project, agent-based is the most relevant. On this platform, we have built a library of objects in the EV landscape. For example, the charge station, driver, uh, stores, cars, these objects can be composed to build the different models. This program actually is what we use for the adoption model that Jim was talking about. And those can be used together. Um, so let me launch the simulation and then we'll go through some more details. So given an EV adoption rate, the main purpose of the infrastructure model is to help design and evaluate a charging network. So what you see here is the experiment setting page, and it gives a brief description of the model and a list of the types of agents in use. The map will be a playground to hold the different static and the moving agents, like charger, the business as the potential charger holder uh, owners, the car drivers, and households. So on the setting page, we can input um, the simulation scope um, by zip codes. Um, the other settings that we can trick with are the sample rates and adoption rate. So now we just uh, keep the default value and assume a 10% adoption rate. So to start, um, it gives us uh, the main view of the simulation runtime. We see a map which is centered at the capital region of New York. The map has two layers. The background shows the major roads and the geographic features. On top of that, we see the black lines are the boundaries of postal areas. On the right up here, the clock is showing the simulation time. So now we create the agents. Now we're going to follow uh, six step procedures by clicking the buttons on the left. So if we click the button, initial map, the highlighted areas cover the 11 zip code regions that we defined in the previous settings. And uh, each region has the data to come from the U.S. Census. The second step, we're going to create households. As you see, and each orange circle is the location of a uh, Households in the simulation. They are not one to one mapping to the households in the real world, but they are synthetic examples to represent the population. So each household has a, some attributes. For example, whether the house is occupied by the owner or the renter, uh, what's the level of household income. They are also examples from US census data. So the third step is to create the drivers. They are probably the most complicated agent uh, in the models. So each 
as the each green dot here is a driver with EV cars, and the orange dot is a driver with IS car. IS is short for in the uh, internal combustion engine, and that is powered by gas. So you can add more car models in simulation, but it usually starts to from uh, simple ones. So example attributes of a driver include its daily commute distance, its car attributes, its driving missions, and also the satisfaction, satisfaction scores. A driver also has a state chart and the several functions to control its behavior. The fourth step, we are going to create some um, potential child owners. We create a source in the region, and the store has attributes um, that define their motivation, benefits, and costs to host charges. And in this model, we also provide some functionality for user to end and then remove public charges. The third step is uh, to create workplace, which is very similar to um, stores, but with different performance indicators. So last, we create a route for agents so they can travel from places. So let's start the simulation. And speed up. So you'll see the dots are moving around. Each one represents a driver and its car. So let me remind, um, the orange one is the driver in an ice car, and the green ones are the driver in EV car. So we can try to capture one to find more details of it. <laughs> Usually, sometimes, okay, try this one. Okay, here we are. Um, as you see here, there this is the kind of status of the charger, of the driver is actually parked somewhere. So in each day, the driver will start from home, select his journey according to some probabilities that you can define, and they will um, evaluate its routes. So we build in this intelligence so the EV car, EV driver will tend to find the cheaper charging opportunities that will result in, that will result in higher EV driver satisfaction. So it also it will determine if the electricity in his car can set, um, can fulfill the whole journey. If not, the driver will give up and end up with a failed journey that will drop the satisfaction. So in the simulation, you also can uncheck the number of um, drivers at a certain place. For example, this is a workplace uh, which you can observe the patterns of cars in the parking lot. Um, currently, there's no charger by this place, but we can manually add or remove. So if you add more chargers, then you can, uh, let's go back and turn off the animation to make it faster. Yeah, so. Yeah, now it's better. And on the left side, on the right side, you can observe the status of the charges. And you will also observe the EV driver satisfaction climbs because people are very happy with the cheap electricity they find in the workplace. So you can do similar things for the stores, but they will have different performance um, indicators. So in all, with all these features, the model can be useful in many cases. If you are a store owner, you can simulate how installing EV chargers can increase your business revenue. And if you operate a charging network, you can simulate where to place chargers to maximize the utilization and customer satisfaction. Or if you are a city planner to uh, try to understand where to install the chargers, you can use the minimum investment to serve the greatest number of the residents and increase adoption rates. So I'm going to stop here, and the next 
is the Q&A session. I'm going to turn the presenter. Hi, everybody. This is Isabella again that you're listening to. So we're ready to take some questions from you. Um, you are welcome to submit them via the WebEx uh, questions feature that I mentioned earlier. And in the meantime, while you prepare your questions, I just wanted to point out a couple of website links for all of you. So if you'd like to learn more about GE Global Research, uh, more about our software organization, as well as some of the other technology domains that we play in, please visit our website at ge.com forward slash research. We also have a blog, which is authored by several of our researchers from Global Research. And that blog's name is Edison's Desk, named after our founder. And the hyperlink for that is www.edisonsdesk.com. There are some other resources as well, Twitter, YouTube, uh, and you can see the links for those. And then finally, we're happy to feature our employees on a day-by-day -day basis through what we call our genius calendar. So please be sure to check that out as well. So with that, I will turn it over to you, our audience. If you have any questions, please submit them at this time. So our first question comes from Ben Schumann, and he is asking how we exactly implement the GIS data, uh, parentheses, zip code areas. And let me turn that over to Shan Chan, who will answer your question. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the questions. And we actually is using the analogic internal GIS capabilities. Um, so, but um, so the boundaries that you see about the zip codes are really based in that um, GIS map. Um, but we do some tricks like uh, add some background pictures to um, add more features to the background. But the GIS map is mainly serves the purpose to calculate the distance between two points. And uh, you can, because it's wholly in Java, and you can extend the capability of the map to do more things. Okay, hi, this is Jerry again. Our next question is from Michael Hilliard, and it's, uh, the question is, how do you determine EV owner satisfaction? So, in our simulation model, which is a prototype, what we were using for EV owner satisfaction is that each uh, driver has their own set of mission an EV vehicle, and then determine if they could complete their missions and with, with the EV range they have and with the charging infrastructure they have. So we were sort of making some simple metrics that might calculate the number of uh, failed trips where they couldn't find a charger, the number of times they had to wait for a charger, and those sort of simple metrics. But we could certainly uh, configure it however we wanted to, to fit the situation. Thanks for the question. Uh, we don't see any more questions on the screen at this time. If you have a question, please. Oh. Okay, so we have another question of how many people worked on this model for how long in total. So let me say we, we started this research in January of this year from a blank sheet. There's no, uh, no models at all. And there's a team of uh, the three of us that you heard from. And at GE Global Research, we all tend to work on numerous projects. So I'd say the three of us worked roughly 30% of our time on this model and uh, accomplished quite a bit. And maybe a lot of that is due to the programming skills of Shan Chan and Jim. But thanks for your question. Uh, we have another question here that says, will you make your models available by geography? So we should just say that these were uh, proof of concept demonstration models to kind of understand the technology and what it could do. Since these are not uh, 
completed or calibrated models, we probably would not try to make them public, but we may develop them further depending on if there's applications and customer interest and GE interest. Thanks for your question. Okay, we have another question. It says uh, from Ben Schumann, where to go from here? If she wants to go forward, would you calibrate this one or start from scratch with more details? So I guess, again, that would depend on the application we were targeting. And certainly since we started this from a blank sheet, we could certainly modify it. I think we would keep and reuse a lot of the software and code we have to date, but we'd probably tailor it to the exact application we want. So, uh, you know, GE software in general, we try to practice software reuse and uh, openness, so modulization. So I mentioned all these things are, uh, this model has a lot of Java code, which we can reuse. So uh, we'll have to see where, where the applications take us for that. Yes, yeah, so we... So we have a question here. It says, uh, who would be the most interested in using such models and how would it help them? So um, we, we see just a wide range of general use in these models. So, I mean, GE was interested to just understand EV adoption. So I think people that business is impacted by EV would want to know just generally about adoption. And then in general, we could think that there would be a wide range of people interested in these types of models from utility customers where they want to understand maybe where the EV adoption would occur and where they might have to prepare their infrastructure to meet that. And then as Shan Chan mentioned on the call, I think, uh, you know, there would be a lot of use from maybe municipalities that want to in install charging infrastructure and how much they would need and how to optimize that and just uh, from various network operators or uh, the various public stores and, and parking lots that uh, want to understand and simulate how, how the chargers might get used. Okay, uh, so we got a couple more questions. So we got one from Michael Hilliard asking, have you examined using optimization techniques to locate the charging stations? And uh, Yes, we did. We uh, we didn't show that because we couldn't show everything in our limited time, but we have models where we sort of evolutionarily place the chargers and kind of monitor where there's more need for chargers, and we do things like that. So we have a question here on how do we how do you like any logic? What is GE management's views on it? Does the company use it anywhere else? And anything that is not proof of concept but used for business decisions? So the answers are yes, we, we like any logic and we do use it on actual applications. I mean, if we've probably been going at this for maybe five or ten years, so it's uh, still in its earlier stages, but the two applications that I did mention, the Hudson River dredging and the Hospital of the Future, are actual live, real models that we developed and used at GE. Yeah, and, and we use it in uh, GE Aviation to, to model the uh, behavior of aircraft engines and, and some of our uh, various energy businesses in a similar use. Okay, we don't have any more questions in the queue. Is there any uh, last minute questions? We'll, we'll hold on for another minute. Uh, and is there anyone dialing in on the phone? If you have questions on the phone, you could unmute and ask the questions over the phone.
Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for all of your great questions and for attending today's chat. And before we wrap up, I really encourage you to go check out our website to learn about more of who we are and to read today's big announcement that we made. Uh, we announced that we will, that GE will be opening a software headquarters in San Ramon, California. We'll be hiring about 400 software professionals. So you can learn more about that, uh, our goals in the software space by visiting our website at www.g.com slash research. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.